Hello. Good morning, everyone. This is Xian Hong, representing UNESCO. Welcome to this session, and welcome this morning session so early. I believe you all are so committed to listening to a very interesting discussion on the issue of artificial intelligence and big data. I mean, this idea of this is the last day. We have heard so many discussion debates on this emerging uh, technology, and its multiple implications on human rights, on achieving sustainable development goals, and also uh, it's so much related to UNESCO's core mandate to support support our member states in building inclusive knowledge societies. I mean, internet has been continuously surprised us all the time in, in the past decades, but it seems the big data and the artificial intelligence are still evolving and very contested uh, technology and terms. We are really opening to this debate. Uh, we have no assumptions, but uh, like to uh, trigger a brainstorm because it seems now the technology such as big data and uh, artificial intelligence, they are fundamentally reshaping human and humanity, the access to information and knowledge. It's uh, changing the way of uh, communication, and also it changes the way of many, many professions, such as uh, journalists, uh, which UNESCO has been working along with for, for years. Uh, I was in um, a journalism conference uh, a few weeks ago, I engage with a hundred of the journalism professors and uh, students. It seems that uh, they are lost. They couldn't know what to teach to journalists. Because nowadays, if it seems that AI robots, they are doing a better job than journalists. And uh, that's a big challenge. I, I, I do uh, perceive the big, big potential the technology can benefit from the social and the personal empowerment. But on the other hand, it's, it's like we still like classic music. I mean, those classic values like uh, journalism uh, as a watchdog, I mean, the human values, I believe they continue to uh, prevail w whenever we are at the uh, time of history. And UNESCO has been uh, advocating internet universality norms in this IGF and also since uh, um, 2015, when our member states conce conceived the idea that um, all technology, we want to harness them for human development. Uh, then we need to, fun to defend those fundamental values, such as human rights-based, uh, human rights-oriented approach should be always taken when we deal with all in technologies, such as with uh, artificial intelligence and the big data. They need, to, uh, they need to advance human rights rather than blocking or threaten any of them, including freedom expression, including freedom of association, including uh, the right to privacy and our personal data and personal security. And second uh, uh, fundamental value we, uh, we pre preserve is that uh, uh, internet should be open technology and the internet industry should be open and we encourage open uh, renovation. Openness is one crucial feature of internet and we believe it's a crucial feature for it to support uh, all other fundamental values. And the third value, a third pillar of the principle we have been advocating about the universality of internet is the accessibility and the universal access. We uh, give a very holistic approach to access. It should go beyond uh, the physical and the infrastructure access, but it talks about the quality of access, the content, the, the literacy, the capacity of individuals to benefit from this uh, fast development of, uh, of, uh, of internet and technology. The, the fourth one is, uh, is um, about the governan governing process of internet technology. We have been in engaging with multi-stakeholder to trigger discussions on internet-related issues. We believe that a very inclusive participation from different stakeholders, from different regions, from different uh, groups in the society should, should, be, uh, in, should be included included in this crucial discussion. Same for the AI, same for the big data. They are concerning the daily life of everybody. That's why we are continuing triggering discussion on norms and the principles and explore the policy uh, implications of these emerging technologies. 
I'm very proud that uh, we are having a very uh, strong panel here, and uh, we have also a good uh, gender balance. And also we have one um, speaker who couldn't uh, uh, make it uh, on the last minute, uh, but I believe that uh, we will have very uh, interactive discussion with the audience, uh, and also with remote participation. I wish you can prepare your questions, your comments, without any assumptions to engage with us. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, sitting to my right side. Her name is Mila Romanov. Uh, she is representing United Nations Global Powers. She is a, a very excellent expert a specialist in the big data and uh, privacy. I have known her, know her for, for some time. Now she's leading a very useful uh, UN interagency initiative on privacy policy uh, working group. Because of this work, because uh, this involvement, uh, I knew her, and also uh, because this push uh, in the, uh, the ideals like UNESCO is drafting our internal privacy policy indeed. So I do appreciate all the work from uh, Mila and also on behalf of her organization, Global Pulse. So Mila, do you like to share your expertise on this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kieran Kong, and um, I'm very grateful for being uh, today as a present presenting as a speaker. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm using slides, and if uh, we're not able to use them, I can go ahead without, but, yeah. So I will start to make sure that we're not uh, running out of time at the end. Um, I'm a, a privacy and legal specialist at the UN Global Pulse. Uh, Global Pulse is a special initiative of um, the Secretary General on Big Data, and um, I will probably be telling you how to click through the slides because I don't have any means to. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so Global Pulse is a special initiative of the Secretary General on Big Data and Artificial Intelligence. Um, our main goal is adoption of uh, big data for uh, for development and humanitarian cause. Uh, mainly right now, the, uh, the, the it shifted to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal with the passman of the Sustainable Development Goal. We can go into the next slides. As we all know, global uh, big data presents uh, terrific opportunities, which I will speak about uh, just shortly. However, and then we go into the next slide, uh, there are also risks that are presented by big data. Um, and then we go to the next slide. Um, Big data presents terrific opportunities for the achievement of sustainable development goals, which is actually the, uh, the title of this panel. And we own um, some of the leading examples within our work um, is, for example, use of anonymized mobile uh, data to understand traffic patterns, um, movement patterns of populations in humanitarian crises, such as floods, um, for example, or how the disease could spread. And these successful projects has proven that use, for example, of use of, uh, for example, anonymized mobile uh, transactions data could help humanitarian agencies in delivering critical aid. Um, another example if use is the use of public uh, data, public social media data, such as Twitter. Uh, all of us are familiar with Twitter or public uh, social media data, such as Facebook. I'm talking about public, uh, publicly available, not the private, uh, covered by private settings. Um, so such data is also um, very important and very interesting and very valuable in understanding what people are, for example, saying at the time of humanitarian crisis. So we performed a project when in, the, in Nepal during the earthquake um, two years ago, and what happened is that uh, was people were tweeting about um, critical needs that they were experiencing, what they, what they had during the humanitarian, uh, during the earthquake. And humanitarian agencies, by understanding and now analyzing that data, could actually deliver and understand in which locations such critical, could, uh, such, um, critical aid could be delivered. Um, on the development side, again, use of social media data or, for example, uh, anonymized postal transactions data, which we've done in collaboration with the Universal Postal Union, could also help understand the economic patterns or how, for example, nations are dealing with economic crises. Same could be done with, and, and we've done with, in collaboration with the BBVA, uh, which, is a, which is a financial institution, anonymized transac financial transactions data could help understand um, how fast the uh, economy is recovering, for example, again, from the humanitarian crisis. Um, and many, and, and if what you see on the screen right now, in, in particular, in accordance with every single SDG and the target set, uh, it is possible to monitor um, using 
anonymized and actually aggregated data. Uh, we're not talking even disaggregated, we're talking about aggregated data um, for the achievement of the sustainable development goal. However, again, uh, even though sometimes we say an anonymized or aggregated data, we all need to understand that there are risks that come with the use of data, even when the data is aggregated. So we can go into the next slide, thank you. Um, so Global Pulse also established, a, in addition to actually driving the acceleration of adoption of big data and technology for the sustainable, for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, um, one part of our work, or biggest part, of, or bigger part of our work as well, is actually the privacy program. And part of our pro program is, besides our own operational privacy and ensuring that um, all the activities that we perform are in accordance with the privacy, um, uh, with the privacy principles, uh, we also do research on privacy um, and understand because the big data and artificial intelligence space is so rapidly evolving, we need to understand how it is changing. We need to test, right? So so we can't really just have one static policy or just one static tool that, let, for example, let, helps us assess the risks. It's actually moving all the time. So we perform research and tests on uh, understanding how privacy is also changing in the big data and artificial intelligence space. Um, and that comes with our innovation in the space as well. So we work with many UN agencies and are also other partners outside of the UN. Um, including the regulatory authorities and private sector and, uh, and research in academia uh, to actually understand the new patterns in privacy and data protection fields. And uh, well, as was mentioned by my colleague Tsing Hong, we're working with UNESCO as well in understanding the privacy implications um, in the uh, development space. Um, so um, next slide, please. In terms of how we deal with privacy and on, on the larger scale and from the policy side, including from my background, um, the, UN, the, the United Nations has the resolution that has been, uh, the resolution 4995 that actually highlights in a general uh, terms uh, the core rights to privacy um, and the establishes the principles of how data should be handled. However, on the more a granular scale, many agencies already have implemented and, and draft, draft, adopted and implemented their privacy policy. And amongst those is UNHCR, UNESCO, as was mentioned, is developing their own privacy policy. UNOHCHR, High Commission of Human Rights, just recently, uh, also, two, not recently, it was two years ago, <coughs> um, um, issued a big date, a, a note um, on uh, how data should be disaggregated in accordance with privacy principles. The establishment of the United uh, Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy is another achievement in this area, um, where the Special Rapporteur is working towards establishing of common standards on privacy and data protection and respect for uh, the right to privacy. Other agencies such as ITU, UNICEF, WFP just recently came out with a privacy policy as well, and many others, um, it's a lot to mention. Uh, what, um, one uh, document that I think was interesting to bring to your attention is actually just recently published um, United Nations Development Group note. Is the um, United Nations Development Group um, is a consortium of over 30 agencies across the UN system that actually came together and Global Pulse helped drafting the note. Um, uh, it's actually available online and um, on the United Nations Development Group website. But it's particularly relevant to, the, to, the, to this panel because um, the note is actually the first instrument across the United Nations system adopted to uh, highlight not only privacy, but also privacy ethics and data protection with regard to big data. And it concerns the risks that come with big data in the context of the achievement of the, tw of the 2030 agenda. Uh, so if you're interested, just please go to the website and, and check and, uh, um, and review it. Uh, but the idea of this note is to be a living document once again, so it could be adopted as the technology evolves. And it incorporates the key principles of data privacy and data protection, as well as touches on, on data ethics. Um, we can go into onto the next slide. Global Pulse's principles, um, and, the, and the UNDG note is based also on Global Pulse's principles, as well as the resolution on privacy that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it also incorporates the key principles on the right to privacy, such as right to use, purpose specification, and data minimization. And I, let me tell you, understanding data, uh, applying data minimization, which is one of the, uh, I would say, issues that when it comes to use of big data and artificial intelligence, uh, is, quite, um, is quite a big issue, which I can, of course, talk shortly, but I don't want to take all the time. Another key question that needs to be considered when we talk about big, about big data is data quality. <coughs> Um, data sets containing biases presents huge risks uh, when it comes to understanding populations and how we can deliver the good to the populations. But uh, many times, 
um, populations could be excluded from the research or from, uh, or from a big data application project. So it's crucial to understand the data quality and also data adequacy when we, when we use um, big data words and the, the big data analytics for the, uh, for the social good. Um, I will move on to the next slide and be happy to talk more about the particular issues that come with big data. But one of the biggest ones is actually understanding the risks that big data presents. And um, with that part, we, uh, we developed a privacy um, impact assessment, which we are actually now naming as a risk benefits and harms assessment, which goes into the depths of understanding the implications of big data on human rights. And what, what, we are do what we're trying to do is actually testing how big data uh, could present opportunities in the same exercise as risks and harms. Mm -hmm. So going into the understanding of the likelihood of the risks and the likelihood of potential positive impacts, we're combining the two in understanding whether, the, for example, this big data or artificial intelligence projects can proceed. And let me tell you that many times we actually had to say no, even when we were using public, public data, uh, publicly available data, because First, for example, if you talk about publicly available tweets, it could be data that talks about um, individuals. But um, the key question here is how do we treat the groups of individuals? And in development and humanitarian context, I think it's important and crucial to, to understand human rights in the context also of groups. And, um, and this particular exercise that you see on the, on the screen right now actually goes into understanding the group privacy and group harms. Um, so let me just, uh, I guess, pause here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as we, um, as we continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mila. It's so good to know that um, <coughs> the big data application in the humanitarian affairs is going in hand, in hand with the data privacy and the data protection. <coughs> Sorry for my throat. And now I want to introduce our second speaker from the Council of Europe, uh, Ms. Sophie Kwasny. She's leading the data protection unit of the Council of Europe and the responsible for the standard setting and the policy on data protection and privacy. I believe we, you also touch upon some aspects already mentioned by Mila. It floors yours. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to UNESCO uh, for uh, bringing in the privacy dimension also uh, worked on by the Council of Europe. Um, so I work in Strasbourg for the Council of Europe, indeed in charge of the Data Protection Unit. Uh, the Council of Europe is an international organization, regional international organization, uh, as its name indicates coming from Europe. But some of in its instruments, uh, some of its uh, conventions are open uh, to the entire world. <coughs> it's the case of the Cybercrime Convention and it's also the case of our Data Protection Convention. And so I would like to say to the entire world, just like the web was created a uh, few miles away from here, uh, our conventions were born uh, in Europe, but were already conceived as uh, open to anyone, so please do use them. If you want in your own countries to enforce that data protection and privacy uh, be protected in a stronger manner, those conventions are there to help you, so do use them. Um, so it's good to speak just after Mila because indeed the potentials and the benefits of big data and artificial uh, intelligence for humankind are huge. This is not questioned. Uh, this is what you will find in any documents act actually uh, uh, addressing the topic. But indeed some challenges may, may come with it. And so my take on this will really be uh, on the angle of one of the human rights, which is the right to, uh, to data protection. Um, one also another point that has to be uh, highlighted, and I think it came very strongly uh, uh, from the European Commission in September, is that big data and artificial intelligence <coughs> do not solely rely on uh, personal data. You have vast processing uh, of data that are based on non-personal data, and this needs to be facilitated. When you have big data and artificial intelligence relying on censored data, uh, um, atmospherical data, for instance, those, of course, uh, do not bring any, uh, uh, any challenges to the right to privacy. 
And another category of non-personal data uh, that uh, can be uh, uh, processed in a big data context is anonymized data. There, we should be a bit more cautious with an anonymized data. Indeed, in all data protection laws, it is recognized that anonymized data is not personal data, so you do not need to afford the protection uh, of a data protection framework. Personal data is qualified as data that enables identification or uh, identifiability of a person. So the possibility of re-identifying re a person actually um, leads what you would consider as anonymized data to, again, fall under the category of personal data. And that's one of the risks uh, of the big data processing, is that anonymized data may lead to re-identification of person. And in that case, you need to apply the data protection uh, framework. Uh, so in, in our work in the Council of Europe, Although our convention is, is quite an old instrument, uh, the convention one way dates from 1981. For the past years, we have worked on modernizing uh, this, uh, this instrument. This is a global trend. We've seen, in, we've seen it with the OECD guidelines that also dated back from the 80s and have been uh, revised in 2013. We've seen it with the EU framework, with now the regulation that uh, uh, will become applicable as of next year. And we see it with Convention 108. We've been working uh, on its modernization now for, for a few years. Um, hopefully next year we will be able to deliver this revised text. And in this revised text, one of the aspects that, uh, that was considered by the expert is to be able to address challenges posed by new technologies. And so s some of the, of the wording of the convention, of this modernized convention, precisely aims at addressing uh, um, new technological challenges. And if I can refer just specifically to uh, big data um, and, uh, and artificial intelligence, I'll mention to you some of the novelties of the modernized convention that are aimed at responding uh, to this. So the first thing is that under the article on the rights of the person, all of us, um, as what we call data subjects, uh, we would uh, have a right not to be subject to a decision significantly affecting us that would be based solely on automated uh, processing of data without having our views taken into consideration. That's uh, a, a first right that is new in the convention. Second, we would have the right to obtain on request knowledge of the reasoning underlying the data processing where such results of the processing are applied to us. Uh, and finally, we ha would have the right to object at any time uh, to the processing of personal data unless and there, there are conditions that may restrict its right. So this is one of the first uh, parts of the modernization that aims at addressing uh, big data processing. And then uh, new requirements placed on the one that holds and processes the data also uh, aims at uh, better protecting us in, in this big data ecosystem. Uh, that is the obligation of transparency that would be put on the controller, um, which is very, very strong now in the modernized convention. And the new series of obligations that are really, uh, that have emerged in, in the data protection um, sector in the past years, that's data protection, uh, da data privacy impact assessments, privacy by design and privacy by default, all those uh, being really necessary tools to, uh, uh, to implement to better protect the persons <coughs> in a big data context. So this is for our general uh, text. This is our convention. If you look at the convention, it's uh, about 20 articles, so it's a general legal, uh, legal text. It doesn't enter, for instance, into the level of details that you have uh, uh, in the EU regulation, but at the same time, in complement to this convention, the committee of the convention that meets in Strasbourg uh, adopts some, some sectoral text. And earlier this uh, year, so nearly a year ago actually, because it was in January 2017 uh, for the Data Protection Day, the committee adopted uh, guidelines on the protection of persons in a world of big data. Uh, you will be able to find that, uh, those guidelines on our website if you're interested in it. And what is very interesting with the guidelines is that they translate the data protection principles that we've had for decades, uh, illustrate them under a big data context, but also bring some novelties that 
had never appeared in a Council of Europe instruments in the field of data protection, and that's, for instance, uh, the notion of ethical and socially aware use of data. That's really new, and that's crucial in this, uh, in this environment. Um, I think what we've seen in this IGF is also how um, the controllers, the private sector themselves, uh, are very active in addressing human rights challenges in a big data uh, processing environment. And this is part of this ethical uh, awareness. This is uh, uh, really positive and to be, and to be welcome. Um, the role of the human intervention in big data uh, processing uh, is also highlighted in, uh, in, those big, in those big data guidelines, as much as other parts I was mentioning on transparency, uh, uh, privacy by design. So I invite you to have a look at the text. It's really, uh, it was the first uh, international uh, instrument on, on the topic, uh, trying to address uh, uh, the challenges. If I also uh, briefly touch now upon really specifically artificial uh, intelligence, it's one of the, of the priorities of the Council of Europe for the future, but not solely in the data protection field. Uh, my colleagues are uh, working on freedom of expression that you know very well, that's the Committee on Media uh, and Information Society, will look into artificial intelligence, but under this freedom of expression angle. We have colleagues from the Bioethics Committee uh, that will be looking at it also. Uh, and another and final example is colleagues uh, working on the efficiency of justice uh, will prepare guidelines on predictive justice when you have the big data, when you have artificial intelligence and you apply it um, in the justice sector. What are, what are the, the benefits of it for the efficiency of your system, but what are the challenges and so we'll be contributing to this work. So as you see, a lot is going on uh, on the topic yeah. and I hope that uh, by the next IGF I'll be able to, uh, to present other work of the Council of Europe. Thank you again. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie. We know Council of Europe has always been leading advocating of uh, internet freedom, whether free expression or uh, privacy related to these emerging technologies. And now I'm introducing our next speaker, uh, Ms. Um, Najira Sambuli, uh, sitting <laughs> to my left side. Uh, she's a young and brilliant uh, women expert uh, based in Kenya as a part of uh, Web Foundation and she has uh, extensive expertise in internet governance, and uh, I do look forward to your take on this. Thank you, and uh, good morning. So um, at the Web Foundation, we concern ourselves with how to deliver digital equality for all. As you know, my colleague said, when the web was invented not too far from here, the vision was that it would be for everyone. And I think by extension, many other technologies that have come to be are also envisioned to be able to benefit humanity. But let me just start by saying that I think with any new technology that we think about and how it will be deployed on humans, we have to remember that no technology will make up for the lack of political or social will to actually enforce human rights. So we may want to place a lot of hope in what big data and artificial intelligence will do, especially for those who've been left behind traditionally. But if the, the um, framework around which they're being deployed is a place where human rights have not fundamentally been upheld, these could very quickly become tools of oppression and further divides. And so I think we need to, um, in any discussions, whether to, uh, at the next IGF it will be virtual reality for development, we have to remember that um, once, if we don't have a strong sound framework of human rights being um, respected and upheld in spaces that we are deploying these technologies, these technologies then become weapons in the hands of those who've been keeping others um, oppressed. So in that frame, um, when you think about how AI and big data are going to be used in developing countries or amongst communities that have traditionally been left behind, we have to assess how previous waves of technology have benefited these communities and what the gaps have been so that we um, hopefully can be able to use any new technologies to also start correcting for any mistakes and uh, shortcomings that have been so far. One thing that comes to mind is that it's very um, sexy to talk about leapfrogging. Um, let's, you know, let's go from uh, landlines to AI. And especially for those of us who come from developing countries, we are always the sites of experimentation with every new technology that comes about. And so even when it comes to the data that is being collected and who has the agency to collect that data, who gets to have informed consent about how data is used to make decisions about their lives, we all happen to more often than not be sites of experimentation and not willing agents in participating in this. And so I often try to call for pause for people who have the power, those of us in these rooms who are making these discussions, and will probably go back and design projects 
to use AI, big data, which name whatever technology, to think about these communities that you're going to be testing out on. They are human beings as well. And if their rights have already been systematically been denied, and we're coming in and saying we're the saving grace with our white hats, we have to remember how do we start building the culture of consent, the culture of being, they themselves being able to um, audit these uh, technologies, question how these technologies benefit uh, their communities. I think that's just um, something that we must always keep at the top of our minds. I think it's great that there's a lot of work that has been mentioned by previous colleagues around conventions and principles, but at the end of the day, they do need some political and social will to have them actually be held in place, because you can have it on paper, but it's no guarantee that it will also translate into practice. So I'll pause for there for now. Thank you. Very short and crisp and very in inspiring. I believe we'll come back again. And uh, my next speaker is um, the gentleman sitting to my to my left, Mr. Tijani Banjama. He is the director of the Mediterranean Federation of Internet Associations. He is a very senior ex uh, expert in the area. I think I met um, Tijani in the first uh, uh, North African IGF. I was very impressed by all his contribution to this region as well. So both your expertise and the regional perspective will be deeply appreciated here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Um, the organizers told me that I have to comply with five minutes only. I will do. Um, the previous speaker s spoke about a lot of things that I wanted to say, so it will be uh, easier for me and it will be more a simplification of things. I will especially address the data protection. As you know, internet users' data are massively collected. They are collected, processed, analyzed, to be used for, for example, scientific researchers, such as medical researchers, economic and social researchers, to better understand the need of consumers and also to improve the quality of services and goods provided. So in this case, collected data may be a source of innovation and growth. But the collected data can be also used for personal attack, for business hijacking, for political interests, or they can be simply sold, and they are sold. They may be used against us without our knowledge. So how to protect our data? There are technical solutions, of course, encryption, etc. But the efficiency of those tools are limited. The more and better security technical tools you have, the less risk you incur, for sure. But technical solutions reduce the risk, but don't eliminate it. There are, there are also legal solutions because we need regulation to, uh, for, collection, for data collection and data use. Again, the efficiency of those regulations depends on how the regulations are applied. And also, as you know, any regulation can cover each and every case. So there is always ways to secret it. Regulations are national and internet is global. This is another problem. Let's say that legal solutions need to be wider to have significant effect. As an example of legal solution, the European Union tried to set legal framework for data protection. They come up in 1995 with the directive number uh, 95-46-EC, and in April 2016, the European Parliament adopted the new General Data Protection Regulation that will enter into effect on 25 on, of May 19, uh, uh, no, 2018. Excuse me. This will be a real move in data protection regulation. With uh, the, the GDPR, the, the General Data Protection Regulation, what will change? We will have more rigorous requirement requirements for obtaining consent for collecting personal data. Also, there will be rigorous um, uh, requirements for storing, for processing, for analyzing data. Also, for notifying the data breaches and appointing data protection officials. The GDPR will have an extended territorial scope. 
it will be applicable to non-European entities or European, uh, European ones that are not located in Europe. It will apply to, this, to, to these two kinds of uh, companies if they target European resident via internet with services and goods or monitor monitoring. If you don't comply with the general data protection regulation, what will happen to you? You will incur fines up to 20 million euro or 4% of the company's global income. GDPR applies to all kinds of data, including internet data, of course. Internet content data and internet domain name data, which we call the registration data or who is data. Those data have always been uh, problematic because we are confronted with two uh, fundamental values, you call them, transparency and privacy. Transparency because we need the data of the registrant to be public so that if there is a, a bad use of the domain name, we can sue the, the uh, domain name holder and privacy because those data are personal and any person has the right to have the, uh, the data or, or her data uh, not public. So we cannot, cons we, co we couldn't right now cons uh, concise those two uh, principles. But with the application of the GDPR next May, a serious problem will be faced if nothing is done before, not only for European registry registrars and users, but also for non-European one having transactions with Europeans. How to protect our data again? We said technical solutions, legal solutions, but you can have the best uh, uh, tools, the best technical and legal tools. If you don't behave in the right way, they, they will be useless. For example, suppose you have the best uh, technical uh, uh, encryption. If you don't update it as, as, nor, uh, as, nece as necessary, they will be uh, obsolete and they will be useless. If you have the best regulation, if you um, accept and you uh, consent to all what is it presented to you, of course the regulation will not be useful for you. So we need technical solutions, yes. We need legal solutions, yes. And we need user behavior. behavior uh, the, the user should be aware of the risks and should be aware of how to behave with the internet. So these are very um, simple and, no, and known um, um, uh, behavior uh, <coughs> rules that I will mention here, but they are not, it's not exhaustive at all. Uh, and we need really to make the user aware of the risk. So I think that the users doesn't have to put the details of their life on internet. Only necessary and not personal things should be put there. They don't have to use untrusted sites and platforms. They don't have to respond to untrusted mails. They have to use the best security tools, technical and legal, and they have to update these tools as necessary. I think that changing behavior and being aware of the possible harm helps a lot. In conclusion, I would say that private data protection has always been a concern. It is more and more important because internet becomes more and more part of our daily life. There is no absolute data protection, but we can reach a reasonable level of protection if we make use of the available up-to-date technical and legal tools, and more importantly, if we change our behavior as internet users. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tijani. Absolutely. I mean, user behavior is a key when we address the new technology as well. Now I'm going to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Fritz Busmaker, sitting to my right side. Oh, sorry. Uh, he's a chair of the Institute of uh, Accountability and Internet Democracy. There's a, there's a flood here on my desk, but it doesn't prevent us from talking about uh, the artificial intelligence. So that, and, and he has a long experience in IT, ICT industry. So I think your point of view will be very much useful to us. Floor is yours. Uh, yep, it's on. Good morning, Fritz, Fritz Bussemacher indeed. Uh, thank you for being on this panel. Um, for the last 30 years, I have been part of an international business community of digital leaders and CIOs. 
and uh, this is now a global federation, and uh, despite the different cultures, the, the different way we are organized, we all see uh, that we have one thing in common, and that this world is changing from one which is from a command and control to a connect and collaborate world. It's changing from an hierarchy to one which is a network. And we also experience a difference in behavior, but what we also notice that one of the big questions uh, that people have as a digital leader is um, sp specifically over the various cultures, um, what's possible, what is not possible. Um, we see these people on that internet uh, having access to a very big data lake and probably it will become a data ocean soon. So it's very tempting to make use of that data. And we continue to see examples of organizations then uh, having an issue with the solution they do try to bring to that network. Um, so the question is, we talk about consent, we talk about ethical, we talk about values, uh, but the translations and the definitions of those uh, words differ per country, different per culture. Uh, so we decided uh, to see how if we could uh, actually uh, do what Hugo Grotius done in the 17th century, who, said, who wrote the Mara Libem, or the Law of the High Sea, and discuss could we need, should we need a Law of the High Sea for the Internet um, and make it accountable. Uh, therefore, with the backing of both UNESCO and the ITU, we will organize a first summary in the Peace Palace in The Hague on the 31st of May uh, to discuss uh, what accountability and Internet democracy means and also how all the stakeholders, multi-stakeholders, and the business will make use of that. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we want to organize a discussion on the Internet of Values and question what those values are before we can talk about the implementation of those solutions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Fritz. <laughs> so now I think the uh, floor is open. And firstly, I wonder if we have any remote participation. Okay, otherwise, <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, anyone, if you want to uh, raise uh, any question, if you want comments, and just uh, yeah, as you hand to me. So I saw three hands, maybe we go from left to right. Okay, the gentleman here. Yes, you are the first. And then we go to the center and then. Good morning, my name is uh, Gabor Farkas, um, member of the Internet Society here in Switzerland, uh, and president of Active Mediation. Um, my question goes um, regarding the, the big data. The cost for the public se sector of uh, data acquisition, I would imagine, is one of the uh, biggest issue I in order to have data to work with. Uh, in the private sector, you have big companies like Google and Facebook who um, have means of, of acquiring data that uh, are beyond those of the public sector. Google uses uh, the data uh, it collects to using AI f to determine uh, the risks of certain pandemics and, and, and trans transmits the information uh, concerning flu, for instance, uh, way before uh, the public sector or, or the public officials are able to to determine that such a pandemic or epidemic is going to to start and where it's going to be spreading from. I was wondering what kind of collaboration it could be implemented in order for uh, the public sector to do its uh, public service, no, the, the private sector, in order to do its public service uh, and uh, use the data they're collecting uh, very efficiently uh, and allow the public sector to use that in order to improve the conditions under which uh, the society could benefit. Thank you, a very relevant question. Uh, maybe we collect uh, a round of the questions and then we go back to our panel to, uh, to give feedback. Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you for the floor. Uh, I am Barnabé Lucas from Brazil. Am I here by the CGA's youth program? My question is to Ms. Mila Romanov. In your presentation, you said that we need to ensure that, uh, that quality. Basically, my, my question is, 
how can you we do that properly and how we know that this data is relevant to achieve SDGs. Thank you. And I think uh, there's another, yes, please. Um, good morning, my name is Christian Jeffer from Humboldt Institute of Internet and Society in Berlin. I would like to address a question to Ms. Romanov and Ms. Gwazny. Uh, thank you first uh, so much for these insightful presentations and uh, the range of perspectives on the issue. Um, I concur with um, Mr. Gemma who said that um, it's, uh, the implementation is important in, uh, in many things. I think it's important to have the principles laid out, but uh, the implementation is uh, the important and sometimes also the tricky part. Uh, we see this in human rights where the Council of Europe has taken great steps to um, really think about implementation in human rights in an all-encompassing manner. And I think we see this in technology um, as well, where we, um, in the design process with new technologies, it's quite tricky to, um, to uh, make the very good um, principles you mentioned operable. So um, to uh, conclude, my question would be, do you also think about the implementation process, the design process, and um, what uh, would your uh, recommendations in this and your activities in this regard uh, be? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, gentlemen here. And also, I, s I, think I saw there's a lady over there. Yes, okay. Uh, okay, so we'll go with you and then two ladies <coughs> afterwards. I'm Amjad Manjur from uh, State Bank of Pakistan. I think uh, one of the very important questions uh, raised by probably Ms. Jema is that uh, the misuse of the data for oppression purposes. And I understand that uh, some work is being done in the Europe to have these uh, laws uh, implemented so that uh, the, uh, the people who are using this data for bad purposes are penalized. But are, th are there any initiatives being done on the UN level? Because there are, you know, most of the population, uh, like in Asia and in Africa, probably they don't come in the ambit of uh, the, some of the regulations which are applicable in EU. So if you, and they, they, those are the places where, you know, this uh, thing is misused a lot. Uh, and then the garb of anti-terrorism activities or uh, anti-money laundering activities or whatever. So are there any initiative on the, on, the, on the platform of the UN which are applicable globally on all the countries instead of, you know, some regional areas? Thank you, thank you. And the, 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 yeah, the lady from there, please introduce yourself. Oh. Uh, my name is Yu uh, from uh, Korean National Diplomat Academy. So my question is very uh, somewhat duplicated previ uh, previous question. So uh, about uh, some uh, convention about protection of data, uh, could you explain more about the follow, um, uh, follow mechanism of Article 108? Uh, that's all for the okay. question. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, Madam there, I'm sorry just now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit perplexed by um, your comments about how people should behave online, um, that they shouldn't put out any information online. Uh, they should be careful about this. Of course, being careful doesn't mean that you're not still going to have huge amounts of information out there, especially as the platform is designed to um, affect your mind in such a way that you want to release information, that you get a rush from making information public. It is studied scientifically to do this. So are we going to say that you're advising major platforms to change the way they design so that it is no longer addictive? I don't think this is realistic. So I, I just did not get where you were coming from on this. But definitely, um, even though I missed the Council of Europe session yesterday on information literacy, I would like to know from the Council of, uh, of Europe what you're doing on the data literacy dimension when it comes to information literacy. Because basically, this is what we need to do. We need to, from the earliest stage of our educational systems, make sure that our populations understand these issues and are prepared in such a way that they can deal with these issues. Now, 
uh, my the colleague from Humboldt, I think, has uh, mentioned something that is quite interesting, as did the gentleman, I think, from Pakistan. Is it time for the African Union to come out with its very clear position so that if people exploit African data, there will be consequences? I know that many young people in my country are having to tick boxes that they are in compliance with the European data law because their applications and their blogs and their websites, etc., are visible there, and so they're going to have to comply. I think that it's time for us to wake up rather than ask people to remember that Africans are human beings and should not be exploited, to actually take it into our hands. And we have models now. Let's adapt the model and make sure we protect our population. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think I'm collecting the last uh, three questions and then I will go through our panel to uh, address these cross-cutting questions. Also, lady here and the gentleman here and the young lady over there. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I am Herr Gamiling from Austria. Okay. I'm particularly interested by the um, uh, presentation of Mr. Bismarck. You mentioned Hugo Grotius, and I found it interesting uh, that the concept of the 17th century is now being debated again. And as far as I know, the Internet and Jurisdiction Initiative is specifically looking into the matter. So what I would like to know if the Council of Europe and the United Nations initiatives are looking particularly in this uh, specific topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen. Um, my name, good morning. My name is Ji Hao Jun, a uh, MAG member from China. Um, indeed, uh, data privacy and the protection is a, is a key issue. Um, in China, we also have uh, big problems in this regard, uh, as, as uh, my, uh, my personal observation. Uh, I, Actually, there was a huge underground black market selling and buying data among different uh, players. Uh, mostly, uh, the companies uh, use those data for targeted marketing. But the criminal organizations also are taking advantage of such data. And you really don't know where do they get this uh, data. Some of those data leaked by by the, the big platforms um, as, a, as a way of making profit. Some of these data are leaked by uh, the personnel of the companies, the platforms, uh, it's uh, in their personal capacity. So uh, in my view, uh, to uh, international norms and national regulations are very important, but the most important part is enforcement of law. And uh, as you know, this is the, the people do this in a very stealthy way, and uh, the law enforcement really have lots of difficulty to to overcome, to 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 you know to bring justice to you know uh, get these people arrested, and uh, it's it's a, it, it, such kind of activity is massive in scale, so it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this uh, useful experience. So, lady, please. Hi there. Uh, Teresa, Oxford Internet Institute. Um, so, we are mentioning privacy and uh, protection of data, which is great. Um, w there was also mentioned the biases of the data sets that were gathered. And I think I will just play a devil's advocate here and say if the anonymization is dealt with, let's suppose that, uh, shouldn't we share even more data to allow the dynamic processing of the data sets and therefore uh, hiring the accuracy of AI systems and the actual systems and processes we want us to help? Um, shouldn't we share everything in order to make the AI more rewarding, let's say, in simple terms. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, I think now I can uh, thank you for, uh, I'm so proud to have so many quality put pertinent questions and observations. I think I will go through with our panel maybe one by one. You can pick on the questions which relate to you and we can just uh, ask them all together. Is that okay? Okay. 
It's okay, but it's Mission Impossible myself. I've, <laughs> I've had several questions addressed to me that each would uh, would uh, need a lot of time. Uh, two minutes. From each two minutes. So about enforcement, uh, I think it's a key uh, matter, but n but the system is is built in a consistent manner that now, if I mention the GDPR, for instance, you will have uh, strong sanctions. Uh, you have DPOs in the organization that are raising awareness. Uh, you have collective actions, and that's what I'm really looking forward to in the future, that will make that there will be no other option than to integrate. And so the, the frontier with the technical uh, uh, development and privacy enhancing technologies, it's not new, it can be done. So we need to find the means to implement the principles. Um, gentlemen, I think I will try to see you after to respond to your uh, question on, on Convention 108, and same thing with you, because otherwise I wouldn't leave any uh, time for the next speakers. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie, I'm afraid. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a very quick comment uh, about the behavior online. Um, personal assessment, I think we are assessing that behavior with our offline norms and values, the values we have used for the last uh, years, uh, how we grow up before we, uh, we were on, uh, we, we came online. So it's the values of a digital native. So uh, assessing how to behave online should also be regarded how, you could say, this new generation of digital natives uh, is uh, now behaving. We have to accept it's changing. We may not like it, but that is what's happening. Um, so, I agree with the few. There's uh, plenty of comments and questions that you know it's really hard to um, answer. Uh, it's easy to answer, but it's hard in terms of the time frame. So please come um, up to me following this panel. I'll be happy to elaborate more. Just a general message. Um, agree. Thank you so much for the comment <coughs> with regard to implementation of uh, big data in private, um, in, in by public sector, and how can we do that? I think, in general terms, we need to make sure that. Um, private sector regulators and public sector are brought together uh, more uh, to cover the gap of existing regulations that um, would, uh, would help implement big data related, related projects in public sector. We need stronger regulations and stronger, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean stricter or less flexible, what I mean is more relevant to big data and innovation in the space. And for that, we need to make sure that all relevant stakeholders are speaking with each other. And currently, I think that's missing. <coughs> Uh, two, point two is that we need to make sure, that I agree, thank you so much for bringing this point about implementation. That's why I brought up my point regarding our assessment tools and also um, engaging more stakeholders to the process. What I mean by that is that when we do have principles, the key implement, one of the key implementation tools is to actually understand the risks and develop mitigation strategies and that's how we can apply the principles that were developed by the Convention 108 and by all the, uh, by the resolutions 9495 of the United Nations and all the guidelines and principles that are part of the United Nations system. Um, so that's one, one of the recommendations, but there are of course other steps to be, to be taken. And my message number three is that in general terms, we need to make sure that we don't think about uh, one right only. Uh, let's say if it's a right to privacy. We need to make sure that we talk about uh, right to privacy in the context of other human rights. And that comes, and that will help us in the achievement of the sustainable development goals and also in building more knowledge knowledgeable and also educa educated societies. Um, with that, we do need to make sure that we educate and bring awareness um, as well as digital literacy to the populations in developing countries. And um, in educating populations, <coughs> we need to make sure we're educated on both, on the risks and on the ben benefits of data use and data misuse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tijani. Thank you very much. Let me uh, answer the question of Dorothy. Um, I never said that we don't have to put information on the internet. It, uh, this will mean that we have to get rid of use of internet, and this is, uh, will be a catastrophe. Internet is a wonderful tool that we have to use it in the right way. I just said that we have to uh, mm, uh, be more rational in the use of the internet because we are, we are all complaining that our data are everywhere and we, can, uh, we don't have any privacy now, but we are giving those data. We are giving unnecessary data. We are, using, we are uh, if you want, uh, uh, making use of the internet for 
we thought that we are, we are only doing that for our friends, but everyone can, uh, can access this information, these photos, these videos. So don't come after that and say, oh, our data are, uh, are, uh, are collected and are used. This is, only, this, this is the only thing I said. I said also that we have to use the best tools, uh, technical tools and, um, and uh, legal tools. Uh, if people don't use, unfortunately, uh, the technical tools for, for, uh, for, for the security, and they are very important also. So it is not uh, um, an issue of uh, not using internet or not putting the information on internet. We need to, to put information on internet if we want to, to use internet. Thank you. Um, just real quickly um, on the question of African positions. Um, around 2014, the African Union started a process on a convention for on cybersecurity and personal data protection, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with the non-starter that it was, but also just showing that certain processes and the limitations of these conventions is such that they were also designed to protect businesses and not necessarily uphold human rights. And that's where the source of these political discussions are. But when it comes to new technologies, I just want to wrap up by saying that at least at the Web Foundation, we've just put out a paper on how we can start a policy dialogue on the use of artificial intelligence in Africa, having sampled what's already happened with AI in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. So I'd be happy to share that with anybody who's interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You have already, uh, already done something uh, impossible to answer so many questions briefly. I think the, the, the ten intention is really to raise more questions rather than finding uh, one answer to it in one session. So the this session just opened, just begins. And uh, maybe uh, my very quick reaction to the last question from our young, young, young lady there. Uh, someone told me, as some occasion saying that Xian uh, Hong, forget the privacy. It has been f lost uh, forever in digital age. Just uh, get over it. <laughs> I'm not convinced. I'm completely not because I believe this kind of uh, fun value, they are not just our rights. Uh, they, they are really something which define our personality, define our humanity. We need a more profound thinking into it. Um, so as UNESCO, we are an intergovernmental organization. We are always standing in a neutral position to, to be a platform to, uh, to bring in different expertise and to bring in different stakeholders to hear different regions and national voices. So we continue to be such a convening uh, platform for you to serve, for you to continue discussion. I myself, we are going to organize another session at the forthcoming WISIS forum in March about uh, artificial intelligence and big data, and I wish to to help you uh, to continue that discussion there. And uh, so you could also uh, leave me your name card or your email address after the session. We are having a mailing list of UNESCO internet policy to push you all the updates and information about the events and initiatives we are about us and also about our partners. Right. Thank you again. And I'd, li I'd like you to join me to applaud for our excellent panel as well. Eleven o'clock. Madam Chat Sa Kardalo. Sa Kardalo. Sans Lil. To Kat Katalikia. Manada is Kay Lika. Madam, Madam, as I scoop a little. I'm Nera Kadla. आज मैं लिख के आऊं इसीलिए मैंने रात को किया था इतने इतनी ज्यादा नहीं लिखनी ईमेल करते हैं उसको लिख के इनफॉर्मल सी रिप्लाई हां मैं कर देता हूं उन्हें हूं असि पाकिस्तानी तान पता फिर असि काम फिर लेखन वाला पे कर सही करने है ना और यार तुम डे बाय डे ना चलो एक ओवरऑल दे दो ये तुम बता दो ना कि तुमने जनरली तुम्हारे एरियाज ऑफ इंटरेस्ट क्या थे थोड़ा इसी के लेके भाई चाय नहीं पीती मजा नहीं आया चाय पीती चाय नहीं थी मिलती मगर यार ठंडी होती है सारी चीजें ये उन्हें से दूध पत्ती तो अन लगना रही नहीं गरम